Thanks, Betsy. Hi, everyone. I'm Jolie Braun, and I'm the curator of modern literature and manuscripts at the Ohio State University Libraries, and I'm the moderator for this session. Um, so I'll start by introducing our speakers and then turn things over to them. So Christina Schultz is a graduate of Miami University and received her Master of Arts degree in public history at Wright State University. After spending over 15 years as a museum archivist, Christina moved into academic archives in 2013. One of her favorite things about her work is uncovering stories within the many collections at the University of Dayton and sharing them with the campus community. When not at work, Christina enjoys spending time with her husband, two daughters, two stepsons, and their goofy Labrador retriever, Farley. Post pandemic, Christina is looking forward to traveling to the beach. Next up will be Bridget Retzloff. Uh, she is a graduate of Miami University where she studied art and architecture history. She later received a Master of Library and Information Science degree from Kent State University with a specialization in museum studies. In addition to providing research support and instruction, Bridget also works on archival processing projects with university archives and special collections. After Bridget, Heidi Gowder will, will present. She is a coordinator of research and instruction at Roche Library. She chairs the university library's instruction team, as well as the Roche Library research team. She is the library liaison to the history and political science departments. After Heidi, Kayla Harris will present, and Kayla is the archivist for the Marion Library, a special library that collects material about the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus. As a jack of all trades, master of none, her current archival interests focus on web archiving and teaching with primary sources. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them. Good morning. Thank you, Julie. I will go ahead and All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to Creative Collaboration, Transformative Times, Teaching with Archival and Primary Sources. My name is Christina Schultz, I'm the University Archivist. And presenting along with me today will be Heidi Gowder, Kayla Harris, and Bridget Retzloff. With a primarily residential campus, the university uses a point system for housing selection. In 2014, Housing and Residence Life launched Aviate, which stands for A Vision for Integrated, Applied, and Transformative Education. Aviate is the integration of the department's residential curriculum and the housing assignments process for returning students. As students engage in campus partner opportunities aligned with Aviate or other events facilitated by Housing and Residence Life, they are awarded PATH credit points accumulated toward housing. That's what PATH stands for. These points impact their housing selection each year. The more invested a student is as an engaged member of the residential community, the better their priority is in the housing assignments process. The university libraries at UD have joined with Aviate as a campus partner to create programs incorporating the learning goals using library resources. To earn points, students voluntarily attend co-curricular learning opportunities designed around three learning goals of authorship, interculturalism, and community living. Authorship challenges students to identify personal values, demonstrate respect for and appreciation of others' perspectives, and recognize the impact of their behavior. Interculturalism challenges students to develop and demonstrate an understanding of their own identity and value other cultures. Community living challenges students to live in a community that prioritizes the common good over individual wants or desires. They learn responsibility and, adhere, and adherence to community standards to ensure community well-being. And as you can see on this slide, these are our Aviate numbers for the academic year 2020-2021. The total Aviate events held during the past academic year across the university 
totaled 316. A total number of 153,387 PATH credits were earned with a median PATH credit earned per student of 23. The University Library sponsored 12 Aviate events with 12,112 attendees. The average attendance per event was 1,009. One of the limitations of the pandemic wound up increasing the number of students we could serve through our programming. The in-person AV8 sessions typically limit the number of at attendees to the size of the room. The restrictions on campus during COVID-19 limited nearly all AV8 events to a synchronous or asynchronous online format. And just to contrast it, the previous year's total attendance uh, for AV8 sessions sponsored by the libraries was 1,460 spread out over 20 PATH eligible events. So I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about an AV8 session that we did in university archives. We created an AV8 session that would incorporate primary sources to align with the spirit of the institution's diversity plan. Using AV8's interculturalism learning goal, University Archives produced a one hour long workshop that introduced students to the Miriam Jacobs baseball collection. Two activities were used to demonstrate that integration of Major League Baseball made baseball a better game. I wanna take a few moments to give you some background on the collection. In the mid 1990s, the baseball memorabilia collection was donated to University Archives. Miriam Jacobs, a native Daytonian, enjoyed baseball from a young age. She attended Simmons College in Boston and came back to Dayton to work as a legal secretary for her brother's law firm. It is not known when she began collecting, but over the course of her lifetime, she created a baseball fan's dream. This tremendous collection of baseball cards, autographs, sports lit, baseball registers, annuals, and memorabilia covers the period from the late 1860s to the mid 1960s. Miss Jacobs was posthumously inducted into the Baseball Collectors Hall of Fame in 2008. Along with my coworker, Amy Rowe Miller, we put together an AV8 session that would introduce students to this amazing collection and share with them the story of baseball's integration by using selected items in the collection. Our learning goals were that students would learn about the Miriam Jacobs Baseball Collection, learn about the history of baseball and integration of the major leagues in the context of the civil rights movement, and participate in two activities that demonstrate that integrating the major leagues made baseball better through introducing a wealth of new talent. Students had the opportunity to interact with a small sample of the collection. High quality scans had been made of the baseball card collection years prior, and these were in binders. Each table had a binder of baseball cards to look through prior to the start of the workshop. Also located on each table were baseball annuals that would be used in the first activity. We began with a brief introduction to the history of baseball in order to give enough scope to include African-American participation in baseball's amateur leagues in the 19th century and the Negro leagues. We used images from the baseball cards in the collection in our PowerPoint presentation. The highlight of the program were the two activities that were created by Amy Rowe Miller and supported by our student employees. Amy will be talking about these activities in her poster presentation tomorrow afternoon. So be sure to attend for more information on gamifying activities. With the first activity, how diverse is your team? We looked at one team as its roster became more diverse. Discussion questions were used after the activity to engage students in looking thoughtfully at the results. The second activity was the student's favorite. Each table of students created their own dream team through a fantasy draft. A pool of players was provided that covered the period from the beginning of integration through the late 1960s, which reflects the scope of Miriam Jacobs' collection. Each player's war stat number was used to determine the winning team. We had mostly positive feedback on the entire session. 
One of the difficulties with in-person ABA sessions, and I wanna point out this was an in-person session, is that the size of the room limits the number of attendees. We limited this session to 36 people due to the scope of the activities. We were disappointed that we had to turn students away who wanted to attend. At the end of each AV8 session, we ask students to fill out a small questionnaire that includes four questions. I liked, I learned, I suggest, and I would like to learn more about. We don't require them to answer each question, but they are encouraged to leave some feedback. In my experience, most students answer all of the questions. So as you can see here on the slide, the results of the uh, diversity in baseball aviate session were overwhelmingly positive. The only negative comments that we had were, were the students who felt that maybe some of the activities should have been um, less, less time consuming. The draft, the baseball draft did take a long time. Um, but they liked the draft. In fact, on most of the feedback, most students liked the draft because they got to create their uh, own lineup. They liked that it was not just a lecture. Um, most students enjoyed learning about the integration of baseball and enjoyed learning about the Negro Leagues. And then um, in addition to suggesting that we have more events like this, students really had wished that we had brought more items from the Jacobs Collection to the session. Um, and they had some good uh, feedback on wanting to learn more about diversity. Some students actually wished that the lecture had been longer. They wanted more information, but we tried to keep the lecture portion short so that they could actually participate more in the activities. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi Gowder. Thanks, Christina. Hi, I'm going to be talking about uh, a workshop that Bridget Retzloff and I organized around patents and Dayton history. I was interested in doing a patent workshop, not only because I'm the history librarian, but also the government documents librarian. And I spent a little bit of time working in a de patent depository, so I know how useful those items can be. Bridget and I, this was our second workshop together on patents, and she brought the same sort of history interest, as well as um, some digital humanities skills to the project. We knew that the library's instruction program does not address patent searching on a comprehensive scale, so we saw this as an opportunity to introduce students to patents, as well as some of Dayton's patent history. The 88 events, as Christina mentioned, encourage active learning. So we knew we also wanted some hands-on experience that connect to both patents and history. And so within that framework, and we worked on the 88 learning goal of community, the idea of working for the common good, we devised the, the learning goals that you see here for the session. The session itself was fairly fast paced. Most of the workshops that I conduct are about an hour. And I think, I think you'll find that standard for a number of the in-person sessions that we do. It began with a brief lecture that introduced the people and transportation routes that contributed to Dayton's role as a hub for invention and, interest, and industry. We also covered patent basics like patent numbers, what a patent looks like, and its value in society. And that part of the session took about 20 minutes. Like Christina, we were trying to keep it informative but brief so that the students could have time for hands-on work. Then the students conducted a search in, in the US Patent and Trademark uh, Database using patent numbers that we had selected and vetted for them. We're lucky in the fact that a local author has written a book on Dayton inventions, and we found a lot of inspiration there. Bridget and I created a patent bank, which is what we actually called it of sorts, collecting patents with local ties and then using heritage quests to locate relevant addresses 
whether it was the patent, uh, the inventor's home address or the company uh, address here in Dayton. We had the students share their search results with us so that we could make sure that they had searched the patent database successfully. The next step, mapping the inventors and invention depended on these correct answers. So we could easily tell at a glance whether they had searched successfully. And if they had, we gave them additional information that they would need for the mapping activity. We set up directions on the classroom screen so that the students could add a pin on the Google My Map we had devised with the additional information we gave them. This part of the activity of the workshop took about 30 minutes. Then we viewed the map on the classroom screen in order to show how the results connected to the lecture, especially the historic transportation routes and the changing neighborhoods, and pointed out some of the innovations that made Dayton famous. Our discussion ran about 10 minutes. Part of the discussion covered the fact that this Patent history, Dayton history, is notable for the lack of women and minorities, which is not an uncommon story and exacerbated by the fact that the US Patent and Trademark Office collects very limited demographic information on patent applicants. We did not explore this topic as in depth as it is warranted, but we did want to make sure that the students were aware that this history has gaps. I also want to note that we chose certain patents in order to facil facilitate success this first time around. Now that we know how a session runs, we will likely need to revise the criteria for selecting patents. For example, we used only patents that were connected to existing homes and or addresses. Maybe this doesn't matter so much the next time. We planned our session for February of 2020, doing so in part deliberately. Students submit their path points at the end of February, so we were pretty sure the timing would appeal to students. And like with Christina's event, we were at full capacity for the session and were fairly pleased by the turnout. One of the benefits of the workshops was that we were able to strengthen ties to university centers that do not necessarily make direct use of library instruction. We reached out to both of the directors of the School of Business and the School of Engineering Entrepreneur Centers, asking them to advertise the workshop, which they did so willingly. Both the academic units have idea incubators where innovation is encouraged and promoted. And in fact, we know of at least two students who have secured patents with help from these centers. The librarians also saw that the hands-on nature of these workshops offered the potential of working with other groups. We extended an offer to a nearby parochial school and the middle school science teacher scheduled two visits to the library. Additionally, Bridget and I talked about hosting a Dayton patented workshop with library staff as a professional development opportunity. However, the pandemic forced us to cancel those plans. One of the lessons that we learned from this experience though was that these workshops could be adapted to different groups and constituents. Bridget and I did discuss moving this workshop online for the fall 2020 semester but we felt that it was better suited as an in-person experience. I'd also want to show you the blurb for our companion workshop, which focused more on patents and their contributions to society. We discussed patents more in depth during this session than we did with the other workshop, but we had hands-on activity. The students did a patent search, and then we took that information and converted it into a timeline. We also played a quick round of Name That Patent, which included a small slice of a patent drawing and the official patent name, which was pretty fun. The students were pretty adept at guessing the names of some of them. We found that these workshops to be a fun and easy way to introduce students to patents as primary sources and a way to look at local history that might not have been considered before. Next is Kayla Harris, who will discuss an online event.
<clears throat> Hi everyone. So I'm Kayla Harris and I'll be talking about an example of a path eligible event featuring an online exhibit from the Marion Library. Before going into details about the AVN event, I'd first like to share a little bit of context that help explains why we designed this program in the first place. The Marion Library is a special library, part of the University Libraries at UD, that collects material related to the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Marion Library is really well known for its collection of over 3,600 nativity scenes, or creches, from across the world. Since the 1990s, the Marion Library has been displaying these nativity scenes around Christmas and has offered an event known as At the Manger to the campus and local community that is a curated display from the collection. In 2019, the Marion Library hosted an Aviate event in coordination with At the Manger for the first time. The program brought in 469 undergraduate students over three days for a self-guided tour of the exhibit. The program met the Aviate learning goal of interculturalism <clears throat> since students saw and reflected on diverse depictions of the scene of Christ's birth. After viewing the exhibit, <clears throat> students had to answer several reflection questions to receive the path point. For example, students were asked to find a nativity set that represented a culture, identity, or heritage different from their own. Then, in two to three sentences, they were asked to relate what they knew about that country or culture's history, beliefs, faith, languages, and or practices. And that same year, the Marion Library and the Crash Collection was featured on CBS Good Morning in a segment about nativities. The segment aired toward the end of December, and we definitely saw a huge increase in our attendance for the exhibit's final open days in January. So all of this is to help explain both the importance of the At the Manger annual programming to the Marion Library, and the momentum to bring this exhibit to even more students and community members. Then COVID-19 happened and staff shortages and the closure of campus to external visitors meant that the Marion Library decided to offer At the Manger as a virtual exhibit in 2020. The exhibit titled On Paper, Nativity Imagery from the Marion Library featured items from the collection that depicted nativity scenes such as paper pop-ups, postage stamps, holy cards, and other artwork. Some of these items, such as the postage stamps, for example, were really fascinating, but not necessarily well-suited for an engaging physical display. Stamps are hard to display, they're very tiny. So the digital format was really seen as an opportunity to show visitors that the Marion Library has many more collections beyond the nativity sets that they see each Christmas. Led by the Marion Library's Librarian for Visual Resources, Jillian Ewell, the exhibit itself was built using the free open source publishing tool, Scalar. As stated on their website, Scalar enables users to assemble media from multiple sources and juxtapose them with their own writing in a variety of ways with minimal technical expertise required. More information about using Scalar and to view the actual digital exhibit can be found on the resource guide that we have put together to accompany our session and that the link will be shared for. We wanted the students to have a similar experience to the one that they had with the guided tour of the physical exhibit. And so instead of just asking them to view the exhibit and then answer questions, we used the tool LibWizard by Springshare to create an interactive tutorial that would guide them through each portion of the exhibit. LibWizard is a tool similar, is similar to a tool called Guide on the Side and that the creator can embed media, a website, an image, et cetera, on one side of the screen, while the other half of the slide can be used for explanatory instructions and assessment questions. The library began using LibWizard more heavily during COVID and for several different Aviate programs. For example, another Aviate program I worked on with colleagues was called Citizen Web Archiving, where students were introduced to web archiving, explored the ethics of collecting information on the web, and archived a website page using the Internet Archive Save Page Now button. What makes LibWizard especially useful is how customizable it can be. In addition to sharing the link of the exhibit on the resource guide, 
I've also shared the link to the Aviate program in LibWizard so that you can go through the program yourself. In the digital exhibit, there are several different thematic pages, Journey to Bethlehem, The Birth of Christ, etc. So students were guided through the exhibit with each page of the online exhibit as its own slide in LibWizard with accompanying questions. The program was designed to take students approximately 45 minutes and the questions were a mix of multiple choice and short answer. Hold on. Um, some were specific to check that the students were taking their time viewing the items while others were open-ended and reflective, similar to the in-person exhibit. For example, one question asked students to list five words describing their re initial reaction to a particular piece of art and therefore had no right or wrong answer. The program was open to students for PATH credit for two weeks from November 27th to December 11th when students went home for winter break. During that time, 1,104 students received a PATH point. A note about the average score statistic listed on the slide. So as I mentioned about customization, one of the useful features is that you can set a question as both required and that it must be answered correctly before a user can proceed. So for example, one multiple choice question asked, in what year did a nativity scene first appear on an issued stamp? If a user selected an incorrect answer, they would be prompted to try again and had to answer correctly before proceeding. However, in the assessment report from LibWizard, the first answer a user submits for each question is recorded. This is helpful to understand why a student might have gotten an answer wrong, and also possibly to detect if a student is just clicking answers randomly. The average score for the students on the multiple choice questions was a 92.96%. And so this indicated to me that students were generally reading the exhibit text to find the correct answer. Then the reflection questions were graded using a rubric in order to receive credit. A final optional question in the asynchronous program asked for feedback about the event to help plan future programming. And we learned several important things from what students chose to share. One student wrote, I liked how we actually got to see the pieces in the collection. When we return to campus, pandemic permitting, there should be path points that offer students the ability to further explore the collection. Similarly, another student noted that they enjoyed seeing parts of the collection that are closed because of COVID, and another noted that it served as a nice substitute for the annual in-person exhibit. While there were students who were eager to see the in-person exhibit or have a chance to visit the Marion Library in person, a few also provided feedback about the asynchronous format. For example, one student wrote, I liked that this could be done at our own pace in whatever time we preferred. There was other feedback from the students about the format of the program. Students liked having the questions throughout instead of all together at the end, and they liked that everything was contained within one browser window. They also liked the mix of visuals, text, and video throughout the program. Several others commented on how enjoyable it was to be learning about art and artifacts for a path point while being asked to reflect on their own experiences. One student even mentioned how much she enjoyed the handwriting event that the library had previously hosted, which is what Bridget will be talking about next. So this year's At the Manger is still to be decided, but whether it's physical or digital, it is likely that we will try to find a way to develop an ABA program that introduces undergrads to the Marion Library's unique collections. And now I'll turn it over to Bridget. Thanks, Kayla. My name is Bridget Retzloff. I'm a lecturer and librarian at University of Dayton. And like Jolie mentioned in my introduction, I also get to do some projects with university archives and special collections. The program that I'll be talking about um, has students working with handwriting and archival documents. And this is inspired by a personal interest and in research of mine in cursive handwriting and its inclusion or exclusion in primary education and an interest in crowdsourced digital humanities projects. This program invites participants to look at handwritten archival materials in a different way than uh, considering the content by reading and transcribing them. 
you can see the learning goals here. And in addition to learning about the history of cursive handwriting, students actually practiced writing in cursive, um, learned about transcription crowdsourcing projects, and then ended the session reading and transcribing documents from archives that were written in cursive. So like I said, uh, we began with a brief presentation about the history of cursive handwriting and its role in education. Then we discussed how cursive is used today and the importance of being able to read handwritten historical records. Students also mentioned other uses of cursive, such as reading birthday cards from their grandparents or other relatives. So it was interesting to hear from them other ways that they still see cursive in their lives. Um, the presentation also included an introduction to crowdsourced digital transcription projects like the Smithsonian Digital Volunteers Transcription Center. Then students uh, practiced cursive handwriting with a series of video tutorials on YouTube and corresponding worksheets like on the previous slide. Experts say that writing in cursive is the best way to learn how to read cursive. So this activity helped them to start to think in cursive again. Um, as many of them had some sort of introduction to cursive in school at some point. Then each student or pair of students read and transcribed a document from university archives and special collections in a simple Google form. I worked with our archivists, Christina Schultz and Amy Rowe Miller to find handwritten historical records in the collections, which students could handle and transcribe. We ended up with a really interesting variety of records, including um, notes taken by early student groups at um, um, the, the previous, the school that UD was previously, St. Mary's Institute, um, correspondence written by professors, like this beautiful letter in the upper right-hand corner that almost looks like calligraphy written by an art professor, uh, grade books and registers of students, like the um, example in the lower left, and a letter from Miriam Jacobs to Babe Ruth, who she addresses as Mr. George Herman Ruth. <laughs> you can see on the right of this slide, the um, simple Google form that I use to mimic the transcription, digital transcription projects from other cultural heritage institutions. And um, I included some of the sort of, um, formatting um, rules that are pretty common in a lot of those digital transcription projects. And then it was just a simple text box where students could type what they were reading. I didn't collect any formal um, information at the end of the session, but some anecdotal outcomes that I'll share are that uh, most students had learned some cursive in school, but many said that they didn't write in cursive now. They all seem to really enjoy practicing their cursive handwriting and um, you know, using the, the worksheet similar to the, what they used in school. And uh, most were very successful in transcribing their documents. Some asked fellow students and or the instructors for a second opinion on specific letters or words. So it turned into sort of a group project um, for some of the students where they were discussing with those around them. So although we each use different methods and technologies in these four co-curricular programs, each one highlighted collections or resources in unique ways by using engaging, hands-on activities and collaborating together across departments. We encourage you to think about how you might engage users with your collections or primary sources using experiential learning or creative collaborations. Here's some questions for you to consider. How might you use some of the strengths of your collection or assets in your community in a new way? Perhaps using a new technology tool that you recently learned about, or by considering the materiality or intrinsic value of items in your collections. How might you use primary sources or elements of your collections in new ways to help users learn about local history or the collection, or about larger ideas like diversity, equity, and inclusion? We'd love to hear some of your ideas or about an innovative program that you've developed to teach with archival and primary sources. Please share them in the chat. Thank you for your time. We're looking forward to answering any questions you have and hearing about some of your ideas. If you'd like to contact us, 
Here's our, con our email addresses and a link to the LibGuide we've created with some further resources related to each of these programs. Christina, would you like to open the link to show people? So here you can see the LibGuide we've created and a separate tab for each of the programs. Okay, so with that, I think we will go ahead and um, and take a look at your questions and um, what's going on in the chat. Thank you. I don't know if you can all see the questions. Um, I wanna start by saying thank you to all of you. That was a fantastic presentation and then there's so, so much to consider. Um, I hope it's all right to start off. I had a question um, and we'll keep an eye on the Q&A as more questions come in. But I was wondering if you could all talk about, um, you know, I'm thinking about this as someone who works in a special collections but doesn't have um, this kind of program set up with a, with with a you know residential housing program, and I would love to hear about how how you made that happen um, and how you got buy in to to have these special collection sessions with students in this way. I think we are very lucky having this AV8 program to work with. Um, we do have to each go through like some training each year to be part of, um, to offer these AV8 opportunities and to um, make sure that we're designing activities that align with their learning goals. Uh, I'm super lucky because I've only ever worked at UD when we had this set up. So maybe some of my colleagues have some more experience with, um, with, marketing and reaching out for sorts of programs like these when we don't have such an awesome um, uh, AV8 program set up. Well, I think um, some of the stuff that we kind of talked about in some of our sessions with forming these partnerships across campus is really important um, because as Bridget mentioned, we are so lucky and that is something that UD um, having this program really does get students in the door. And then once they're in the door, we have found it is easier to bring them back for non-aviate things. Um, I think it's been interesting seeing in the comments, you know, um, students who will comment on an aviate session that they remember coming into the Marion Library for a class or, or something. So they start making these connections and aviate is just one of those points along kind of their path of um, their interactions with the library. But, um, you know, like as Heidi kind of talked about a little and maybe she can talk about it more, or Bridget, with those like partnerships with these other programs on campus, like the, um, the School of Business. And, you know, that is really important to especially for, for institutions that don't have a program like that of advertising events and getting students into the to the library. And, and I can add, having been here before AV8, it was a struggle. It was a struggle to do that kind of outreach and programming. Um, so we are very lucky to have that kind of built-in motivation um, thanks to our, uh, our, our residence program, um, the, the housing program. Um, but I would, I would agree with Kayla that even though we do have that motivation, it still helps to reach out um, across campus and, and work with people. And, and one of the things that um, I think Bridget and I kind of kept in the back of our minds when we were working on the, the patents was, are there other groups that we could potentially reach out to? So like I mentioned, the, the parochial school nearby, um, which was kind of a bummer. We had, we had all kinds of game patents and, and recent patents that the students might have been able to figure out um, all lined up. So um, we were also thinking about our community in that regard. 
Great. Um, I see some questions coming in, so I'm going to read off one here to you all. Um, this looks like it's for everyone. Um, how did you decide which collections and types of records to use for your sessions? Did you base it on reference statistics to see what people were interested in or base on personal interest or highlight material which does not normally get used? I can answer this first because it's mine's a pretty easy answer. Um, so for the exhibit, um, as I kind of mentioned in my session, we have so many things in the Marion Library that aren't as well known to the public as our nativity scenes. The nativities, the creches are great, but they're they're kind of the most well-known aspect of the Marion Library. So for our exhibit, we were really focusing on things that maybe didn't display as well in person um, or that people wouldn't see or know about otherwise. So as I said, some of those like postage stamps or um, paper materials. And so that was an easy way um, to look at and highlight things that don't normally get seen. Yeah, I'll, I'll also chime in on this one. Um, with the Miriam Jacobs baseball memorabilia collection, we, um, we started using that two or three years ago for a sports lit class and it seemed to work really well. And in order to get it out to more people, we thought um, uh, aligning with the diversity goal of the institution and trying to bring in the, um, the, the learning goal of having students understand integration, using those baseball cards that uh, Miriam Jacobs had collected that that cover the period of integration from 1946 into the mid 1960s. It just lined up really well. And um, students really enjoyed looking at that collection. So we, we look forward to getting it out again. We are hoping that with this next academic year we'll be in person. We, we had looked at putting this online and the fantasy draft is the key piece of this um, this aviate session and we just could not really replicate that online so for the reading cursive handwriting program it was a kind of a different sort of selection method than uh, than basing it on the content of the records and that we were looking for really interesting examples of handwriting so I think Christine and Amy picked things from really um, interesting collections like the notes from the student groups and um, of course the letter to Babe Ruth. Those are popular collections that get used a lot. But some of the other ones I think were, some of the other examples were things that might not get used very often, and, but they happen to be really great examples of handwriting. So that could be another way to think about um, using things based on their materiality or um, elements of their intrinsic value, such as the, the quality of the handwriting. Great, thank you so much. So I see another question here. Um, I'm not sure it doesn't specify who it's for. I think Kayla, it might be referring to your presentation. It asks, is the integrated learning software free? So no, um, Scalar is free. The tool to build um, to build the online exhibit, that is free. And that is something, um, as I mentioned to you, it's pretty low barrier, um, don't need a lot of technical expertise to use it. And it's fairly easy to set up an account, et cetera. The LibWizard, on the other hand, is paid. And that is part of the SpringShare suite, suite um, which uh, is the same suite that like LibApps and LibInsight. And so a lot of academic libraries may have access to it. Um, other archives may not necessarily. But I think what was kind of interesting about it is the library had had this tool for a while, but it wasn't really until COVID that special collections um, started thinking of ways they could use that. I know I had never used it until the pandemic. And so if you, you know, if your library, if you're a part of an academic institution and your library has the Lib App Suite, look into whether or not you might have Lib, Lib Wizard because there are opportunities to, to use it for teaching with special collections.
Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. If any attendees have a question, please go ahead and type it in. I'm gonna ask one last question myself. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more. Um, you all, I think, have alluded to in various points um, planning for fall. And so I'm curious to know um, how you're doing that. I think we're all kind of in this situation of not being entirely sure what's happening yet. But I'm also really interested in terms of thinking about, I think Heidi and Christina, you both mentioned how successful your programs were and you know space being an issue. So I was also interested to know if you think you're potentially looking for bigger spaces or you're going to have more sessions or or what what lies ahead for all of your your different um, activities you have planned. Um, we've been told that things will be in person back to full capacity in the fall. Um, and of course, there's always that having to be flexible because we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the fall. We're planning on doing maybe multiple sessions of the diversity in baseball because the draft is a complex activity that if we have more than 36 people, it makes it hard to keep track of. So for us, it's going to be offering multiple sessions. We typically had offered two sessions, and I think we might increase that because it, it, we were turning probably 10 or 20 students away at each session, and it was heartbreaking. <laughs> I, you know, I, I hated to tell them, no, they couldn't attend. So, The space that um, Christina and I uh, used is the, the teaching classroom in the library, and it maxes out at um, 48. Um, so Bridget and I are, are going to be talking this summer about whether we're going to um, do the patent workshops. Um, Hopefully there's a way to make that happen, but uh, we're, we're just kind of, we need to take a look at our workload in order to do that. Ours has um, uh, some serious startup <laughs> work with it in, in developing the patent bank. So um, we do have to bank, pre, you know, prioritize time in that regard. Um, but I don't think we would move to a bigger space. And within the library, there's really, for classroom activities, there's not, that's the biggest space that we've got. Um, so for us, I would say the answer is maybe, hopefully, <laughs> at this stage. Yeah, and I'm kind of interested in exploring and maybe continuing doing some of the online opportunities too. That was an option before the pandemic for this Aviate program to do either synchronous or asynchronous um, online activities. But I don't think anything, I don't think anyone in the library had um, or archives had done that before. But as you saw in those numbers, we had lots of participants in those online activities. And for some that, um, uh, maybe require a little less hands-on learning or that can easily translate online. I think that the, we might still continue doing um, some of those online offerings because we can reach so many more students than the 48 that fit in our classroom easily. <laughs> The numbers that you presented were really, really amazing. And Kayla, I was, I was kind of fascinated that you were able to kind of pivot so quickly and and make a digital collection or a digital exhibit from a physical exhibition. Um, I don't know if you all see any questions. I don't see any others. If, so, if people don't have questions too, I mean, we'd be curious as as the, uh, we showed on our slide, if other people would be willing to share in the chat, you know, kind of their ideas for how they might think about their programming. Please share.
And I'll just mention that um, we've put the LibGuide URL in the chat in case anyone wants to check out this um, website that has lots more resources available for, from each of the presenters. Um, and while we're kind of waiting for just another moment to see if anything comes through chat or q and I'll also mention that um, after we wrap up, we're going to take a lunch break and then please join us back here on Zoom at 12.30 for Making It Workflow, New Employees in an Era of Change. I don't see anything else in Q&A or chat, um, so maybe we can just wrap up a few minutes early. And I'll just say once again, thank you to all of our presenters and thank you again, attendees for joining us today for a really fantastic session this morning. And I'll see you all this afternoon. Thank you.